ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and to uh, join us in the in-house council forum. Uh, my name is Rajat Mukherjee. I'm a uh, M&A partner uh, in the corporate practice at Khetan. Um, our in-house council uh, forum is really designed uh, to be a private educational program and discussion forum uh, for in-house council teams uh, in India. The program is structured to provide education in not only substantive law, but also management and other topics of interest to in-house council. Uh, the forum is private in the sense that participation is by invitation only and not open to the public at large. Uh, Chatham House rules will apply to any questions posted uh, and responses discussed during the, during the webinar. So let's look at the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, our topic today is uh, how to conduct internal investigations, a very hot topic uh, in, in today's uh, world. Uh, in summary, uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, I will ask a series of questions to Manvendra to cover uh, various aspects on how to conduct an internal investigation. And this will be followed by a Q&A session uh, with audience questions. Uh, we've already received a number of questions uh, from the audience in advance. Uh, and uh, if you have additional questions, please uh, use the facility provided in the webinar portal to post them. Uh, if we cannot cover all the questions uh, as part of the webinar, we will uh, send you uh, responses uh, offline by, by email. So maybe if you're wondering why a m and partner is uh, hosting or moderating a session on white collar investigations, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take you back a few years. I was a fairly young partner in 2011 when one of the clients I was uh, representing in an m and transaction was accused of fraud uh, post-closing with both parties uh, complaining to the enforcement directorate uh, on various grounds, including money laundering and uh, and breach of foreign exchange regulations. Uh, that transaction and its uh, aftermath uh, left a very strong impression on me on the importance of robust internal checks and internal investigations and how in-house councils and KMPs need to balance the interest of internal and external stakeholders when faced with an event which triggers the need for an internal, for an internal investigation. So looking at the evolution of uh, the importance of uh, in, in internal investigations, it was not until the Satyam scam in 2009 that companies in India began to really realize the importance of strong internal controls and the need to run comprehensive investigations with external lawyers, forensic experts, market intelligence reports and the like. Uh, while traditional notions of how one should run an internal investigation has uh, completely changed in the last few years, uh, there is no fixed manner, procedure, or standard SOP uh, uh, following in such uh, cases. There are various gating questions that as an in-house counsel uh, which come to mind before kicking off an investigation. Sometimes the facts are so apparent that there doesn't seem to be the need for one. And sometimes the allegations are so significant that one cannot decide whether to ring fence the board and the company first or conduct the forensic uh, or uh, do a parallel prosecution pending uh, forensic. So clearly there is no one size fits all approach to, con uh, to conducting invest uh, internal investigations. And depending on the nature of the trigger event, uh, companies will often have to choose the best approach in the circumstances to address such investigations, which leads to the questions on the floor today, which is how do we really conduct an internal investigation uh, my partner Manvendra is uh, going to try and answer some of these questions uh, and while he maintains that there is no perfect way to conduct an internal investigation, we will get him to share his insights and practical experience based on handling uh, numerous uh, such cases. Uh, Manvendra has led uh, substantial domestic and cross-border investigations in his role as one of the leaders of our white collar uh, practice. And uh, he advises clients on a range of topics, including siphoning of funds by employees, management issues, aggressive revenue recognition, uh, standard whistleblower complaints, FCPA, uh, India leg of FCPA investigations. Uh, he's advised uh, foreign uh, forensic auditors and represented uh, clients before uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, multiple courts and forums. He's uh, sought out by clients in, in matters where companies want to prosecute or need advice on self-reporting or disclosures and has overseen investigations for various clients, including listed companies. 
Uh, he has represented uh, forensic investigators, general counsels, and high court proceedings where the independence of the investigation itself uh, have been challenged. He's uh, advised uh, promoters and founders in cases where uh, they've attempted uh, to prosecute after the completion of the investigation, and therefore indeed has seen a journey uh, from whistleblower complaint to an investigation report uh, to prosecutions uh, and the trial court. So with that introduction, let's uh, kick off our discussions uh, with Manvendra. Manvendra, welcome. Uh, why don't you kick it off by telling us a little bit about the present scenario for investigations in India and the changing scope uh, of investigations? Thank you. Thank you, Rajat, so much. I think you sort of dealt with most of uh, what, what, what the change has been post-Satyam. But uh, I think uh, what, what really is very important, uh, and, and I, I mean, like, I'm seeing some of the people we have worked with are there in the audience, and I'm sure they will vouch for it. Historically, investigation was always a defense strategy. You know, like people will come and say, oh, we have got this report, let's look, uh, how do we, what do we do about it? Should we at all do an investigation? Does it allow me to protect the company? I think the, the first most significant change is that today it has become an offense strategy. People want to do an internal investigation so that know what are they facing, what are the dilemmas, what's going to come out of uh, the investigation. Uh, the biggest, I think, uh, COVID brought about a lot of uh, work from home and other significant lot of challenges. Uh, we have this uh, whole mindset in India that uh, and you don't really want to go and look at every nook and corner. But when people went back to their homes, when people had more time on their hands, and they started exploring, they really discovered that there are a lot of business functions, a lot of employee functions, simple stuff like scrapping, all of which is having an impact and all of it sort of needed an extra look in. I think the most important aspect or change that GCs and key managerial personals have now come to realize in India is that your internal investigations are as important possibly today as a normal audit internal audit or statutory audit that's happening on a routine basis and instead of waiting for a trigger event it's better to go and look within before you really are waiting for something to explore and i mean like that's something which i tell a lot of my clients that uh, you know with the same cause of action today you are having a eow complaint you can have a cbi fir the ed picks it up and does a pmla investigation and once they are done with you, then the serious fraud investigation office comes in and looks at the same issue all over again. So if the government has four different agencies looking onto the same set of facts, I'm pretty sure the Indian promoters and companies have now accepted that one investigation at their own end is definitely something that is important. Uh, the primary reason the Prevention of Corruption Act has introduced a clause in 2018 amendment which provides for third party bribery. So your vendors, your contractors, even uh, consultants that you have hired in the due process, if they are found to have been indulging in anything which is gratification or an attempt to gratify in nature, a company and its directors are liable. And hence, uh, whilst employment conducts uh, are forming chunk of what we have seen, I think that's an uh, important increase in bid rigging investigations cutbacks, private bribery, which are otherwise not regulated. And at the same time, post-merger discovery of reps, like you mentioned in your case, and, the, and uh, a lot of ESG-related aspects which are coming out now, Pollution Control Board, Building Permits Violation, and all of which sort of need to be looked at from an impartial and a proper procedural way to ensure that it does not lead to repercussions in the future. Great. Uh, so before we can get into the process of how to to conduct, I mean, can you can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the triggers? What are the circumstances that can trigger the need for an internal investigation? No, absolutely. I think uh, I think uh, gone are the days that you really wait for a whistleblower complaint at every point of time to sort of you know to start something. Uh, I think uh, misconduct allegations are something which have always historically resulted. It can be employee misconduct, it can be a sexual harassment complaint, it can be financial misconduct, it can be something as simple as petty cash, or it can be something massive as revenue recognition, wrongful accounting, uh, 
sending funds abroad under different heads, which we now be entitled to a PMLA or a PEMA violation. Uh, that said, I think uh, I would look at what we have seen recently in the last two, three years. Uh, bid rigging is something that has really picked up. And uh, when I say bid rigging, I don't mean that you actually have to sit down, negotiate the terms of your bid, but uh, inserting clauses which are favoring you over a competitor, uh, putting out requests to, uh, to in, a, in a bid condition, which uh, sort of disqualifies someone in the technical bid. Because earlier it was to be a simple writ petition. The L2 bidder would go to the writ court and file a writ saying, oh, I should have been considered, and that was like the end of it. Nowadays, a lot of these are seeing proper investigation by vigilance departments. We know of a lot of such investigations in Andhra Pradesh and uh, uh, and its neighboring state, Telangana, which has resulted from it. There's a, similarly a lot of bid rigging uh, allegations which are floated in Maharashtra from a lot of infrastructure projects in the national capital region, from technical projects, some airports uh, with regards to the how the particular systems were adjusted. So this is something which is definitely uh, up there right now as a trigger. The next trigger I think which is important is breach of security, the ransomware attacks and other are commonplace. I'm pretty sure like our audience has dealt with some of them and know what to do in those situations. But a novel kind that we have seen again, a very COVID discovery was corporate espionage by planting data. A very innocuous email comes from someone saying, hey, do you want customs data of the product that you are selling for 5,000 rupees? Uh, the person said, oh, why not? He paid in the money. In comes an email with 25,000 line items, all customs data of that particular port. Within 15 minutes, the police and a custom officer outside the premises arresting the guy, taking the laptop, because they knew exactly that this particular data is going to get planted. This was a fight between two conglomerates who are dealing on the very same product, a niche product. Eventually got settled, but uh, these are some things that are coming out these days and you have to be very mindful. And the messaging that has to be going across uh, to the companies has to be very clear as regards to what are you looking at. Aggressive accounting is something that has picked up. It's been in the news always. Uh, I think there are different sectors which do revenue recognition in different manner. But I think uh, with certain recent developments which have been in public domain, in ed tech, radio, and other space, this is something which I think the regulators are also looking at a little seriously. As and, uh, That's also something which I think companies really need to look at, especially MNCs, the way their Indian entities are recognizing and what are the global standards that are being followed. Uh, we have seen safety incidents are triggering internal investigations. Uh, these are cases where uh, proper care was not taken. They could, they could arise from an employee-related accident or some other incident at a workplace, but whether the independent protocols were followed, whether the people who were supposed to do their job did that job properly, even those are nowadays outsourced to lawyers for the sake of privilege, we'll deal with it later. A very interesting one we saw was uh, with us football club uh, where there was a lot of allegations with regard to racial discrimination and the way uh, things are being run. There's a massive issue in Australia arising out of the same thing. But even in India, we did something where the ethnicity of certain players has led to a uh, bipartisan nature in which they were being treated. Uh, I think a very interesting one also is with forgery of documents. Again, COVID period, a lot of people not in office or your signature can be copy pasted on documents which are then printed and then sent out. So that is something which has been in the news and uh, that is something which we have seen a lot of action on. But other than that, I think environmental concerns, ESG violations, health and safety, product quality, these are some of the sectors which uh, I think are active. World Bank is something that we have seen again kick off uh, recently. There's an integrity pact uh, where World Bank projects have to follow a certain standard. and. Uh, if you are an entity who's a supplier to World Bank, you're looking at five years disqualification and a amount of cutback if those are not going through. But I think I think that's that's the broad context of uh, the triggers. So I'm just uh, in the in the interest of just in continuing in the same vein as we kind of look at uh, from an in-house counsel's perspective. 
before we get into again some of the issues in terms of how to how to uh, deal with a witness etc i mean if if what should be as in house counsel what should be my first reaction when i receive a whistleblower uh, complaint or report of uh, wrongdoing containing serious allegations so uh, again i will like you know like you to break it out into two sets we have the uh, indian companies and house councils and we have the mncs in india and house councils and the approach is drastically different i mean there are cases where uh, you know you will straight up you have an sop you have an identified way you know who is the person to be reported the general councils are given enough powers to go and appoint lawyers immediately and then there are companies where first a call is taken that or should be at all investigated if we are investigating it uh, who will do it what is the cost benefit analysis etc i think the single most important thing today is uh, really to take a quick call do you have identified parameters as to which case you investigate which case you let it be those cases that you investigate first thing first get a lawyer in place i'm sure you all are aware now of the pmla rules change which has made our cas or cwas as designated person under the money laundering act and hence you don't want a situation where your privilege protection is sort of lost get your lawyers uh, in us again gcs have privilege protection so they don't need to appoint third party lawyers they can straight away come in the investigation on their own but in india you definitely need it uh, in place make your appointments through the lawyers do not appoint a forensic on your own because then you are not able to gain privilege if your lawyer appoints a forensic accountant or a it forensic for you then the privilege protection is sort of maintained plus the advice that is given the findings that are given are regulated uh, i always personally say please assess the credibility of the company don't have to immediately jump into an investigation uh, maintain confidentiality reach out to the whistle blower if there's a whistle blower or do a small preliminary exercise to understand that is this something which is actually worthwhile or this is something which is just a disgruntled or a frivolous complaint which has come in the air for listed companies please determine your legal obligations it's very important because companies act sebi regulations today have a lot of disclosure norms so that is something that you have to keep in mind when you are looking at any sort of complaint or any sort of potential investigation if all those are tick marks then you initiate your internal investigation again please be very careful about the scoping of your internal investigation don't let it run into a wild goose chase or you know like a, a like a fact finding mission where everything keeps on that comes out will become another limb please be very careful as to how you notify your board of directors if it's a complaint which can potentially result in a prosecution or a law enforcement agency asking questions of your key managerial personnel please ensure that you don't go and just send an email saying they are directors fii this is what we have received you are putting them in knowledge and then they cannot have plausible deniability if there's any summons or there's any request so assess is that something that has to be put before the board if it is something to be put on the board what is the best manner to do it can you give them a summary saying we have received an investig we have received a whistleblower complaint we have appointed x law firm we have appointed y forensic auditor we are looking and do it and we'll come back to you with the findings if any what is the best way to really document it is critical and i think the next part which is important is please make sure that you are complying with the reporting requirements internally there are a lot of joint ventures where there's a particular reporting requirement which we have seen people not meeting out uh, does is there a disclosure required if there's a data issue sort has to be informed within 24 hours have you done it the form and manner can be different but the fact that you need to do something that is very critical and uh, one very important thing for indian gcs is we know that you know the costs have been prohibitive there have been experiences in the past where people uh, have gone into a fishing expedition and the things have spread over and hence or not all of you may have the best experience with your past investigations but if you scope it right if you control the process and you ensure that you are working with a set of people who will listen to uh, what you want to really achieve from that particular process i think that's a big comfort and we've seen a lot of lot of uh, 
Indian entities, the small promoter companies, MSME companies who have come and who have got things done and, and I think it's worked out for them. So let's change gears and let's talk about uh, some process issues, right? I mean, you've conducted a lot of, uh, you've worked with uh, in-house councils and conducted a lot of uh, in internal investigations. Uh, how do you deal with some situations? Uh, let's let's uh, throw one out in terms of a, let's say, uncooperative witness or uh, or, or somebody who's uh, refuses to be interviewed. Um, how do you deal with a situation like that? So I mean, like every straightforward uh, investigation will always have one of those accused because he knows he's done it wrong. And uh, how do you really go about it? Uh, no, I think. Uh, I'll give you a case study actually. We did something very recently for, for a big company, 12, 14 custodians. We took everyone's devices because they had to be imaged. It was all company devices. So the mobile phones and company laptops were taken. We found a particular device which, you know, when you screen it, we found Barbie movies, a lot of pink photographs, a lot of uh, real kiddie stuff. And uh, we Ask the person like, hey, what really are you doing with this office device? And the guy goes and said, oh, I'm sorry. I think I got my daughter's phone by mistake. My phone, I've been using this. I mean, just to give you a very simple example, that's what disruptive people can be. You can't plan for how these witnesses will work in your favor. But uh, I think I can tell you one thing. My biggest learning in the last 10 years has been work with the legal team and the HR team and with that one person who knows these people well. They will tell you the traits. They will tell you character traits of the people and you know what to anticipate. Uh, for an uncooperative witness, there is different ways. Some of them will succumb to badgering. Some of them come on a high horse. So to build a rapport, give them the confidence, ask them questions which are open-ended. Ask them questions that they're willing to talk about. Right? And if you have been able to establish some sort of comfort, and then if they're willing, they've reached a particular stage, then let the questions come. But at the same time, there will be witnesses who will come with a quick speech. They will all parrot it. They have spoken internally. They all know what to answer. If you ask them on whose instructions you did this particular siphoning, there was a managing director told me to raise cash. I mean, these are actual instances that I've given you. So, so those kind of situations, you have to be very prepared uh, as to what are you doing do not record you can don't have a video recording when you know that you are dealing with a hostile witness because they can ask for it at a later stage to be produced record it uh minute it down have your external legal counsels minute it down so that there can't be an allegation of bias as to what has been recorded address the concerns there are times when you know we have seen that people come because they have very fixed concerns which are very opinionated on what they have heard if you can address it, uh, it's 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 great. I mean, we've seen some of them open it up. Those witnesses or those, uh, I would say custodians, because at times we don't know which way they will turn out depending on the findings. So do not want to come, right? We just flat refuse to attend. Please see your code of conduct. Can you enforce their attendance? That's the first thing. If you can't, the code of conduct does not provide for them. Please document the refusal. Document the refusal specifically on the grounds of refusal. Do not send out scathing show cause notices. Start with a simpler request for meetings and thereafter build up depending on what is the intensity which is required in the communications. Please ensure, ask for evidence in writing. Let's say the guy is not willing to come, ask him for his uh, statements that you are aware of, what are the findings that you have found, ask for those in writings. Uh, we have often seen people have very hardwired approach saying that, oh, we can't disclose anything, we can't disclose a document, we can't disclose a finding. See, if a person is not win willing to testify, is not willing to come for an uh, inquiry, he won't come either way. So are you better off confronting him with an evidence that would lead him to give a justification? There are manners in which it has to be done. And I think that is very important. Uh, one thing which we have again seen is uh, the comfort of hometown. Like if you are doing an investigation cross-border or pan-India, go to their offices. Don't always call them uh, to where you want to record it. You can do it subsequently. From a jurisdiction perspective, from a convenience perspective, it can be done sub subsequently. But if you think that someone's evidence is critical and you need to interview the person, we recommend going down to the city they are in 
try and sit down at a place where they are comfortable. Because even if they don't turn up, you record all of that. And uh, last but not the least, uh, if it's an extreme case or if there's a genuine apprehension, give a two-pager letter to the local police station where you are conducting the witness interview, informing that I am going to be a part of our audit process. We are doing something. If we may require your assistance, don't put an allegation, don't put a blame, do not refer to what the investigation is. Because we have dealt with a case where we were in Lucknow, we interviewed uh, three witnesses against whom there were very specific allegations. The reports, uh, forensic report uh, said it. The next thing we knew was that they went and filed police complaints against the directors who had met them earlier, basis which the lawyers got involved saying, oh, he, they, one of them stopped me, one of them threatened me, uh, one of uh, them came to my house and abused my wife and children. So, you know, the point is that whilst you are doing it as part of a management review, the, the GCs, the HR, they know their employees better than the lawyers. So take that call, be smart about it. And I think, I think that really is the way to go about in, in such hostile situations. So, I mean, that kind of segues into my next question, really, in terms of interviews, right? So, how should interviews be documented or recorded? What's the best yeah. practices or learnings that you can share? So, again, like, uh, see, please understand why the interviews are conducted in an internal investigation, right? There are two kinds of interviews. One is fact-finding, where you are interviewing to know what is the fact, how has things been played out. The second is confrontational, where you already know the facts. You have done your audits of the for imaging, you have done your review of the documents, emails, you know what has transpired and you're wanting to put this guy uh, to cross-examine him and to record it. When you're doing the fact-finding interviews, you do not need to video record it. You just need to make sure accurate minutes are kept. You need to give them the scope of your question. If there is a confession, please record the confession properly by Indian standards under Evidence Act. If you can get him to swear on an affidavit, that's your best case scenario. Notarize the affidavit. It does not need to be on stamp paper if you are not able to find it. Uh, but at the same time, preparation for these interviews, I think, is very important. Have your draft questions. Do not have the same draft question for everyone. It's a waste of time. Talk to the legal counsel, talk to the person who really knows these people well about what is the kind of a person, will he succumb to badgering, is he forthcoming, is he very introverted, is he KG? Get to understand the person a little bit before you get into the interview process. I personally always advocate to choose the venue of the interviews very carefully. Neutral places work better. Uh, office premises, if there's a floor where people don't look at you, oh, that's a dirty floor. If he's been called in there, then something must be wrong. Lawyers' offices are sometimes a great choice if you want to hold 10, 12 people's witness interviews on the same day, and you need place to keep them in one particular place. Uh, one important learning, again, uh, we have seen this in five, six cases now, where you feel or where you have enough evidence to know that there is, there is wrongdoing and you want to prosecute, please choose the city where you want to interview if it's a pan-India thing or it's a global thing, because your territorial jurisdiction of where the information has come to your knowledge is going to become important. And you may then need to prosecute or file a criminal complaint in the city where you've done the interview if you want to accord cause of action to it as compared to the place where the particular incident has happened or in some other place where part cause of action has arisen. That is something which is very important. Uh, choose your panel right. Please, you, you don't need to always have 10 people on a panel. You can do very well with a three-member panel, but at the same time, if there's someone who gives comfort to this particular witness, who's being in the panel assists you, keep them on the panel. One lawyer, one legal team in house, one HR personnel, and another employee who you sort of have given a clean sheet is a very good enough panel for these kind of cases. Forensic team's uh, involvement is important when you have to confront the witnesses with a lot of evidence. So if we move now to the confrontational interviews, direct approach works best. If someone doesn't want to give you answer, they will not give you answer. 
you may spend uh, 20 minutes, you may spend two hours, but they will come with a fixed line of thought, so they will not give you. Do not have to beat around the bush in a confrontational interview. Please dive into the aspects. Please ensure you show them the evidence. A lot of times we have faced issues because questions are put up, it's recorded, there's video recording, audio recording, but the actual forensic evidence is not shown to the witness. That's important because please remember at the end of the day, if this report comes out or if this report is utilized in any, any proceeding, you will have to meet the same standards that the Indian law sort of prescribes. And you don't want these minor procedural aspects to otherwise uh, like de derail what you have done in a proper formal manner. Uh, accused, okay, the witness also has rights. You know, when it's a person who has been accused and you are interviewing that particular person, please inform him that the people are not his lawyers. There are situations where people have asked for their lawyers to be present also in the room. We have allowed it on a case-to-case -case basis. But uh, I mean, like in US, we do the Miranda warning and FCPA investigation. That's something that you also have to do in an Indian context scenario. Document the interview. The documentation can be done as a real-time narrative, which can be done taken by a third party. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an allegation that you intentionally did not put something. Ask them for giving written clarifications or ask them to write down any additional points that they want to say in their own words in such cases. But uh, I mean, all of this said, again, there's, there's no fixed rule of what is the best way to do an interview, but knowing the people, knowing the situation usually works the best. So you've done the interview, right? I mean, so now you you move. Let's move on to the investigation uh, report, right? What what is the form format for an investigation report, uh, and is there any critical areas that need to be kind of captured, reflected in that investigation report, so that you can rely on it if it were to go down a path where you need to rely on it before a court or any any forum? Yeah, uh, great question. I mean. Personally, we have seen investigation reports range from 30 pages to 30,000 pages. Now, uh, okay, let's just understand why the investigation report is important. Okay. If you're doing an internal investigation basis of a whistleblower complaint, which mandatorily requires a report at the end of it, you need a report. If you're doing an uh, investigation which is showcasing that you, the company, have dealt with a particular allegation, you have followed the procedure, you followed the protocols, you need a report. Similarly, if your statutory auditors want to report something under 143 and they are deeming it to be a fraud and you want to ensure that no, you have taken all the necessary precautions to ensure it doesn't, you need a report. But the times have really changed, Rajat, and you know, a lot of investigations we are doing today, the clients are actually telling us, show us a finding summary. We are doing a presentation to the board and there are only cases where you really need a report that a report is being churned out because there are a lot of cases where you don't need a report at the end of the day. Uh, again, like, uh, you know, I'm glad you said uh, to you use for prosecution. This, the, one of the biggest misconceptions that was there was that law enforcement agencies actually take your investigation report and use it to prosecute. They don't. Even for that matter, if you have a confession, that confession by itself is not good enough. You need the evidence to back the confession. So it is the collection of evidence and it is the recording of evidence to satisfy a particular charge or an allegation, which is the key ingredient of every investigation report, not so much as the form. Uh, that said, some of the very standard requirements, please do have an executive summary. The executive summary is the only thing we should go to the board. They don't really need to know the nitty gritties. They don't need to know the annexure. They don't need to know that on 17th February 2023, the employee G paid 10,000 rupees from company's account for his personal liquor expenses. Give them what they really need to know. So that's critical. Uh, we have always uh, at least done an introduction or a background, which sort of gives uh, an idea to the person, what was the scope of the investigation, what was the methodology used, what was the owners, and and that's a place where you can nudge any third party or independent party who's looking at this report for the first time to start thinking about it in the same lines as you have drafted it. So if there are three or four interpretations possible, your introduction should be done in a manner that you are 
putting them in the particular lane that you want them to read on. Our findings need to be clear. You cannot always have it may be, it can be, it may be construed, which is something which we have found uh, in a lot of cases. If the findings are not clear, do not record them as findings. Put them under analysis, and only those which are done as findings should be put under findings. Give clear conclusions. No one wants an investigation report after a two-month or a month exercise, which gives every the conclusions are in the air. Wherever you have clear conclusions, please do the give the clear conclusions and stand by it. It's just about the same thing as to taking a stand in a courtroom or taking a stand in a board meeting. That's a view which is reasonable, you have to stand by it. Uh, something that we always uh, do separate from the report, but it, it can be an initial, is recommendations. What are the changes required? Uh, see, the time cost benefit analysis of every investigation is not the same for a company. They may have different, depending on which part of the year. If you did an investigation on in March because you found out about revenue recognition, it's more important that you close out your financial loop then go and do a fraud risk assessment across all systems, right? So the recommendation should ideally be a different uh, document. It can be an annex show, which can be implemented by a company under its own timelines, rather than uh, going ahead and uh, forcing them to sort of do it as part of the report. And then you have the standard appendices, which is all the supporting material and everything that uh, really has come out as a part of this particular thing. And uh, one, one point here, uh, which is very important, we have seen a lot of times people trying to use the investigation report to argue out a case, you know, like the circumstantial evidence, you don't have clear evidence. The idea of an investigation is not always to arrive at a result or a conclusion. It's an independent investigation for a reason. Uh, don't have to draft a report where you are trying to nudge or you are trying to forcefully argue a fact situation rather than just putting the facts on it. I think that's very critical in today's day and age. There's a lot of competition and we've seen some of these reports go south in the courts or before the ROC MCA because of these issues. So, so one topic I want you to spend a couple of minutes on very quickly, I know you touched upon it earlier in the webinar is on privilege and you know, how is, why is privilege important when, you know, to what does it extend to uh, does it extend to internal and external communication and uh, the investigation that is done internally? Yeah, okay. Uh, the first single most thing uh, as of privilege is that it protects the company, right? Uh, the law is very clear in India. Uh, legal privilege covers all advice, all communications between a lawyer and its client done as part of the mandate. Uh, which means that when you get a complaint and you don't know what to look at it, where to look at it, what can come out of it. If your lawyers are the ones who are going and doing that particular bit for you, then the lawyers will report back to you with their findings. And there's a control system. You are putting in a barrier between yourself, the board and the actual exercise. Second, there's a lot of filtering which is required. Because like I said, I give you an example, right? Someone comes uh, to the forensic uh, which showed that an employee had taken an almost 1.2 cross in that case, a simple cutback. He was inflating the production request for a particular product because the raw material supplier was giving him a cutback of almost 20% of every invoice. And uh, when he was asked as to why we're doing it, his reply was, oh, the managing director wanted to generate cash. He told me to do it, I have to take it home and give him cash. Now, this interview, thankfully, was done with a lawyer present, and hence, Eventually, when we did prosecute, it was dealt with properly. It was recorded properly. The advice given by the lawyers to the GC at that point of time as to what is to be done was privileged because the, the inquiry did come. The first thing the police officer actually asked was the GC, so did you ask the managing director whether he did it? And that is where the privilege stepped in and played a significant role. But at the same time, uh, under FCPA for US, there's that's the whole concept of voluntary disclosure, right? Now, who decides? You can't decide that unless your investigation is complete and your facts are in front of you. Uh, your privilege protection is critical because your lawyers will advise you whether this is something which falls under voluntary disclosure, this is something which does not fall under the criteria. That's that's very important. I think uh, right now, I mean, a lot of GCs would be busy with the statutory auditor compliance getting done four days away. Uh, similar 143 request, people come and say, oh, look, this is deemed as a fraud. 
a simple Indian penal code uh, forgery by an employee on a third party does not become a fraud under Section 447 of the Companies Act, right? But to take that position, you need that privilege protection that, okay, look, we have done it internally. We have seen what is required and, uh, and it does not amount to the same thing. So privilege helps you in, uh, in A, doing a fact-finding without having any threat of repercussion, mitigates your legal risks, decides how you do your self-reporting, decides how you take on whether you want to prosecute, you don't want to prosecute. There are a lot of cases where you just want to terminate the employee or you let him resign. There are cases where you claw back. How does that money come back into the system? What do you showcase that? All of this, if you're done in a proper manner, uh, protects you because of privilege because the next thing you know is that someone who's gone out of the system comes and sues you for wrongful termination, comes and sues you for threat intimidation. So that's where privilege really becomes a boon. Now, unlike US in India, the GCs do not have privilege. So that's something which is very important. You know, the, the audit committee is appointing the lawyers for conducting the investigation or the general counsel or the legal team member is appointing that is crucial. In US, the general counsels do have privilege. So it's a little different when we deal with them. Similarly, in France under Sapin too, there's a different protection accorded to GCs, which is not the case. I mean, for that matter, Germany does not have corporate criminal liability. So any instruction directly puts the board members, the general counsel in the perspective of the hot seat. I think these are things which also have to be kept in mind. And, and a privilege to protection. On, uh, yes, to follow on kind of uh, coming out of privilege and process, right? From a general counsel's perspective, you know, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, you know, spend a couple of minutes on them. I mean, first question is, should in-house councils be part of the team set up for the internal investigation, right? Uh, I mean, the question really is that, you know, the in-house council may have to subsequently defend uh, the organization in potential future litigation. So what, I mean, how do you kind of balance the two roles uh, and should they be part of the investigation uh, team or not? So those teams which have multiple, uh, like they have a legal team in-house, right? You can sort of isolate and you can choose as to who from the particular team will be part of it. You can have a panel, you can have one HR, one compliance, one legal, one risk if you have a risk team uh, who can be part of the panel. Uh, look, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of issues which are going to come out, which need real-time discussions, real-time solutions. We think it's always beneficial to have a member from the legal team who's part of the panel or part of the investigation process because they are also the people who are giving the instructions at the end of the day. That said, if there is any allegation specifically on the said member or a decision where he is party to or there is a set of allegations pertaining to any policies or any business decision where he has the legal officer really is involved or he's on the board of directors, then he should step away. Any, any legal person who's on the board of directors should ideally take a step away and not be actively involved in the process as such. The conundrum of protecting the company's interest vis-a-vis -vis conducting the investigation in a fair manner, again, where there's an audit committee which is recommending the investigation, the legal counsel can very well be part of it because the board process takes over. So there is, a, there is sufficient protection under the Companies Act and thus immediate protection under the other laws which are applicable to this situation. Uh, the one thing that uh, we obviously always tell the GCs in these kind of situation is that the authorized representative of the company, if you can find someone who has better knowledge of the fact and situation uh, and who's not a lawyer, I mean, a lot of law enforcement agencies really like it. If it's a court proceeding, you can come and the, the legal team can always sign off as the authorized representative. We don't see any issue or bar. Uh, rather, uh, it's been beneficial because the legal person can claim that he has personal knowledge of the incident or the facts that came out during the interview. So I think it's a it's a situational analysis. But but yeah, I mean we do encourage uh, in our legal teams to be part of the process with us. And uh, again, you know, you the example that you gave in terms of uh, you know as part of the interview, you know the finance manager says that I took out the cash from the instructions of the managing director, right? So yeah. in terms of just hierarchy of reporting within the organization, again, the in-house counsel's role become in, in a situation like that becomes pretty critical, right? And also then 
how do you how do you um how can you ring fence the company and the board in this situation yeah no so i think again like i think single most important question every gc asks themselves when this situation comes up i think what's what's important here is to understand what is the information that really needs to be given to a board uh then sometimes when the when a director has received a complaint he's given it to the general counsel and say please see right now in that situation once it has come to your door uh and you've decided after doing a preliminary test okay this needs an investigation upon the investigation start the findings report it to the board in a manner which is on a need basis do not have to report to the board to showcase the process that you are doing i mean it's very important that the promoters and board of directors also understand the changing nature of times and have faith in their gc cfos to run the process on their own rather than trying to micromanage it because the more knowledge that the board has of a particular set of allegation the more the board is opening itself up to being summoned if there is a prosecution or does not have the deniability that it does not involved in the day to day process of the running of the company that's very critical the second bit is again like if you have an audit committee in place take it to the audit committee let the audit committee vet it and thereafter the audit committee will table it in the board meeting wherein you have followed the protocol where every level is protected in the particular manner in which it has to be protected third it's very important uh, today for a gc to take real time decisions like if there are instances like the name dropping which is coming take a call you know your managing director well is he someone who will need or want to know this send him a whatsapp message saying that we want to speak or tell him that i want to have a call with you pick up the phone and inform them on a call that this is what has transpired this is what we are doing about it i will let you know what the next steps are rather than them getting jumpy about it the one advice which i have given which a lot of other industry uh, like colleagues are uh, don't often is that see it's very important to know how your investigation is going to play out in the court because let's understand if anything that can be done at a company level that's the end of it right you only have disclosures or you have like financial penal the real risk comes if that investigation report goes to a law enforcement agency it goes to an economic offensing police sfi or anyone and then it is tabled in the court it is uh, you are summoned to answer questions as to why particular things were written in a particular manner why did you not report it if this was going on for three years what was the statutory auditor doing have you taken him to task in nfra i mean in ilfs we have seen like everything that can go wrong has sort of gone wrong so in those situations it's very critical that you understand how do you uh, how do you that you have to report i mean it is not a case that you know it's only 20000 rupees we we'll let it be uh, or this guy's career will go to waste so we we'll let it be sometimes it's just important to go and report it file a complaint don't want to prosecute pro, like you don't want to prosecute don't prosecute don't push for an fir don't be aggressive in follow up but leave a complaint or leave contemporary evidence in place which sorts of ensures that a person cannot backtrack or remodulate it similarly if you are firing someone let that resignation letter or the show cause letter have all the clauses of the finding it's equally important that you sign a non disparagement and a non disclosure undertaking with the employees as and when they are leaving the system or the company uh, at the end of an investigation and all of these things today are absolutely critical to enforce uh, the rights that are there i think the, the, those those rajas would be the my top top four five things to ring fence okay thanks oh, and just one last so, yeah sure go uh, ahead in of custody we have seen this happen at times you know like someone's given you a laptop to be imaged it's a 10 o'clock in the night you've taken it home you've brought it the next day you've given it to the forensic guy you have broken the chain of custody because you have had that laptop for 12 hours and there can be a tampering issue so please ensure that chain of custody is something which we have seen really have critical repercussions and uh, that is dealt with so i'm going to take a there's a bunch of questions uh, that have come in uh, prior to the webinar as well as uh, as part of uh, the live uh, chat that we've been having so i'm going to take uh, some of them um 
One is on uh, impact of uh, privacy regulations on internal investigations. Yeah, I mean, with with uh, DPDP etc. I mean, what is the what is the current you know overlap interplay of uh, privacy and uh, the need for an internal investigation? Yeah, no, no, it's very critical. So the consent is the threshold uh, of everything in this particular cases. Uh, you obviously have to take consent or take informed consent, but there are ways to do it. If there is a code of conduct, if there's an annual document which is going every year to employees, which is a deemed consent, uh, that should sort of regulate it. Please ensure that uh, you are dealing with devices that are uh, office devices and the personal data is deleted. You don't always need the personal data. When you are doing a scan, sometimes the bank account statements come up. If it is something you need for the investigation that you are doing, then let your lawyer give you an advice that, okay, this is needed for X reason. And hence, we will look at this particular information, which ring fences the company from violating it. But if there is no need for it, but just because that's some information which oh, we can use on a rainy day, don't keep it in your system. It's always best to remove it. The, the other bit which has come out with the new data is how and where is the data held? Is the data in India? Where is the server? Are you accessing it from outside? Now, those are situations which also have to be taken clear measures and regard of. You can't have a relativity platform set up in Australia, which is hosting all Indian data, and you are doing the analysis there, or you've outsourced it to, a, uh, to any forensic team, which has outsourced it to their employees. Those are things which won't work anymore. So you have to be very careful uh, as to where your data is held, whether there's adequate consent, whether information taken is covered within your policy. And I think revamping the IT policies of the companies are must in light of the new DPD Act. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm just reading it out, go back him. As mentioned, cross-examination. Is the cross-examination requ required basically as part of the investigation? If you have sufficient documentary evidence, which are establishing a particular fact, and you are wanting to terminate the employee and not prosecute him in future, you can do so. You will have to give them a show cause notice under the employment laws and whatever clauses you have in your company and thereafter terminate him. We have seen situations where companies don't want to put facts on the notice and they terminate people for loss of faith. Uh, please ensure that you are ring fenced from the evidence and other statements that you have so that the non cross examination, which is basically giving him an opportunity to justify certain allegations is not required. It's not an absolute must in every case, but definitely the most important defense for a case of wrongful termination. Okay. Um, next question. Suppose there's a potential anonymous complaint. What is the first step? How to ensure that wit witness would maintain confidentiality? Uh, should there be some sort of undertaking from the witness uh, that he signs basically relating to maintaining confidentiality? Yeah, we always ensure that for every witness interview, there is a confidentiality form. The confidentiality form contains specific clauses for non-disparagement, non-disclosure, not using the information received during the interview for any personal or private gain, or for that matter, not discussing it within the employees of a particular uh, organization. Every witness that you interview has to sign that. Okay, and the next one is like a fact pattern, uh, which I'll uh, go through. Evidence is found against accused of having done financial transactions with vendor, violation of code of conduct. All circumstantial evidence is also present. When accused is called for the interview, he denied coming physically, citing medical reasons and un unable to work. However, he was coming to office but refusing to attend physical interviews. Three separate attempts made by, with the help of HR and ombudsman of the company to call him for interview. In such a case, his refusal to attend interview and also evidence on his financial transactions with Winter, can punitive action like termination be initiated? It can be. Again, we discussed this, sort of record it well. I mean, in this particular fact scenario that you have given, you've asked him for interviews on two occasions and is not turned out right to him saying that we know you are in the office. We, you are, we are we required to interview you for X purpose. Give the scope, don't give the entire details. We have incriminating evidence which we need you to come and clarify. Should you not turn up, then we will accept it as valid. And this is the last opportunity being accorded to you, failing which the firm, the company will take necessary steps as, uh, as advised on the law. 
and at which point of time you take a legal view from any lawyer saying yes this is good enough to terminate terminate him for x y z reason or you want to show cause notice give him a show cause notice for termination and call him uh, but it can be terminated you don't have to really be uh, taken for granted by your employees in these situations i think these are cultural aspects you do it a couple of times everyone sort of close the line after that so one uh, very interesting question i find uh, it's uh, subjective right in terms of how an investigator behaves himself right how how to ensure investigators personal unconscious bias does not affect the investigation process and how does one investigate senior members of the leadership without intimating or notifying their close associates yeah no i mean uh, look we are all humans and at the end of the day there will always be a bias one thing that at least i have seen is that uh, try and see if your panel which is questioning is different from the panel which has actually done the forensic analysis because the unconscious bias develops as a result of being participating in the amount transaction etc where you already form a narrative in your head so when you are asking question you are asking questions to justify that narrative the single most point important thing of any investigation is it is a fact it's an independent fact finding mission it's not a way to justify a preconceived notion even if there's a confession to it it's not uh, what we have done in the past i can tell from personal experience we keep four or five members from our team for every for big ticket investigation and uh, we divide it internally between members and uh, often you will find two people one person who's dealt with a particular person's uh, details and another person who has not dealt with only seen the red flag analysis and the question sit for the interview when we are doing the interview uh, the questions are usually asked by the person who's not actually done the investigation and supplemented by the person who's done the investigation and uh, i mean see there can be other things like you know like you can have uh, there, there can be like uh, religious bias there can be generic bias there can be prejudicial aspects because of past history of the investigator at which point of time please find a most polite way to exclude them from the room or have a bigger panel in place I have a panel which is four five people so one person's bias will not lead to a single sided agenda or a single sided questioning flow which really comes out of it but uh, again raja it's it all stems from the fact that you know we all like a lot of time people are trying to prove that yes the allegations are correct which is not the idea of an investigation you are not there to prove you are there to investigate i think if that one thin line is drawn uh, you will find a lot of this automatically go away great uh, manvendra i think a lot of a uh, lot of things to think about uh, even uh, even for uh, someone like me who's uh, you know advisors boards on uh, tricky situations like this and it's uh, it's uh, so important to kind of continue to engage collectively when you're looking at advising uh, in house councils and boards in terms of uh, situations that you've kind of gone through in the last hour or so so for me at least uh, some of the key takeaways uh, you know i think one um, the sense i get is that investigations today is very different from what we what we did historically right the landscape has changed completely given the number of regulators that given the number of stakeholder external stakeholders involved um, especially if you're a listed company your obligations uh, are are enormous and the pressure on in-house counsels today uh, i feel investigations is no more an exception it's it's the rule i think it's it's important for us not to look at it as a burden but really uh, as a mechanism and enabling mechanism uh, to analyze uh, and enable the process to to for the you know for water to find its level right so that's one key i think the second one for me was privilege i think importance of privilege and and things that could go wrong if you don't uh, attach privilege early on in the process um ring fencing the kmps and the board obviously critical in uh, any significant investigation so i would say that that is my uh, key takeaway so i hope the i hope the audience uh, found uh, the, the the hour well spent uh, mitesh if you if we can, if i can request you to put up the slide for uh, a poll i'm requesting the audience we'll do a quick uh, 10 second poll uh, just to give us some feedback on the on today's webinar and you know it will really help us to uh, continuously improve our um, our webinar series
Thanks, Rajat. I mean, I just leave with one last word for whoever's left. It's not anymore, do I need to conduct an investigation in this matter? The question is, if I conduct an investigation in this matter, what is it that I will find out? And even if I don't need a, a trigger, does, does something doing something like this help me as an organization? I think, I think that's the mindset you need now. Great, uh, Mitesh, you can move on. I, I hope everyone's put a, a voted for us. Uh, conclusions, uh, concluding remarks. Look, again, thank you for everyone who joined uh, today's webinar. I hope you find it uh, found it uh, helpful. Uh, please reach out. I think we've tried to take as many uh, of the questions as we could, uh, but if we haven't, like I said earlier, we'll try and uh, respond offline. Uh, thank you, Manvendra, for, uh, for spending time and uh, and a very good interactive, I think, uh, discussion. Um, and uh, again, to the audience, thank you uh, very much. And we look forward to your continuing participation in our future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.